Hi everyone, my name is Elodie Kwan. Uh, I'm a UX visual designer here at Blink uh, and super excited to, to give this talk today on uh, perfectionism killed the designer. So uh, it's a little play on on, uh, on the radio kill the TV star uh, and, and hoping that there's some there's some fun uh, that you guys will enjoy today. So uh, I'm going to start off by telling you all a story. So when I was a kid, uh, my parents asked me what instrument I wanted to play. So uh, at that time, I was a tomboy, uh, so I picked the drums. I thought it would be super cool. I, I kind of wanted to be like all the boys. I thought it would just be cool. Uh, and so my parents got me this drum pad here, uh, and I I kind of complained to them. I was like, Mom, Dad, I need a real drum set to get into this. Uh, I can't, I, I won't know if I'm a drummer on this drum pad. Uh, and my parents, you know, being the reasonable people they are, uh, you know, kept saying, hey, why don't you start on this drum pad, get a feel for it, uh, and see if you actually want to pursue it before, uh, before we really invest in those drums. Uh, and uh, stubborn little me was like, no, like I need a drum set. Like I need a drum set to know if I'm a drummer. Uh, so after a few months, reluctantly, my parents took me uh, to go look at some drums. Uh, and, you know, we were talking to an associate, uh, you know, and they were showing us some, you know, cheaper drum sets, some beginner ones, uh, you know, even checking out this clearance section, maybe even the U section, uh, all things that were very, very suitable for a young kid starting out. Uh, but then as I was going around the store, uh, my eyes sort of landed on this really beautiful blue, white, ombre uh, set of drums. Uh, and I told my parents, Mom, Dad, I have to have this drum set. This is the only way I'm going to know if I'm going to be a drummer. Uh, and so, mind you, this drum set was double the price of anything that we were looking at, you know. Uh, my parents were like, no, like, and no, we, you know, just let's start with like a cheaper drum set, get a feel for it. Uh, we ended up leaving the store without buying any drums. Uh, but a week later, my parents uh, surprised me with this beautiful drum set, that white and blue ombre uh, drums that I was talking about. Uh, and they said, you know, this is your Christmas present, your birthday present for, for this year and next year. You know, um, we want you to try out and be a drummer. And, and, and I was over the moon. Uh, I quit drums maybe six months later, uh, if even. It was probably five, four or five months. So uh, why am I telling you guys this story? So uh, I want to tell you the story because of the role that perfectionism played in it. Uh, I convinced myself that uh, until I had the perfect right setup, until I had these perfect drums, uh, that I wouldn't be able to get started, that I wouldn't be able to uh, actually figure out if I was a drummer until I had all this right stuff. Um, I couldn't even try it out until it was exactly right. So I never really got started because uh, by the time I did have this perfect setup uh, as a little kid, I already moved on to my next interest. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about why perfectionism in the de design field is actually a bad thing. Uh, and while not as dramatic as the title uh, of my talk, uh, how it can actually have some negative impacts on us. Um, but then I'll also talk about uh, how you can fight perfectionism, um, how imperfectionism is not only a crucial part to the creative work, but also what makes us human. Um, so let me start out with uh, this cartoon here. Um, so this cartoon says, uh, caution, perfectionists at work. Uh, and I think it's kind of funny because it says next uh, fourth of a mile because as perfectionists, you know, they couldn't get more than that. So um, I think there's three pieces of this cartoon. There's three conversations going on uh, that I think really sum up three big effects of perfectionism. So first, uh, just zooming in on this one, uh, this conversation. God, look at that. It really sucks. I can't believe how much I hate it. Ah, why did we even start? Um, so this is what I call stopping before starting. So uh, sometimes the perfectionist in us tells us that unless there's a guarantee that everything is going to turn out exactly as planned, uh, the little perfectionist in us say, why even get started? Um, why even try? Uh, we want to make sure that everything is going to turn out exactly as planned or else there's not even a point to starting. Um, and so we tell ourselves that we won't apply for that dream job until we have that right amount of skill, that right skill set, that perfect skill set. Uh, we don't start a project until we have that perfect set of design tools. Uh, and in my case, I don't want to start drumming until I had those perfect drums, uh, which by that time was a little bit too late. 
So we stop ourselves before we even get started. Um, and so many opportunities fly by because of that. Uh, and then this other conversation here, oh, there's a bump. Uh, oh no, we're gonna have to do it all over again. So I know a lot of designers and a lot of creative struggle with this, myself included. Uh, honestly, I think if we didn't have deadlines, most of us would continue designing on the, uh, continue iterating on the same design for probably eternity. So we get super wrapped up in the details. We get consumed by all the things that aren't exactly right or exactly as we had envisioned. And we get super frustrated. We keep trying and trying. We keep iterating and iterating. You know, maybe we push pixels uh, over a few. We hate it there. And then we move it back and we just keep going. Uh, and this is what I call spiraling to burnout. So uh, burnout as defined by Herbert Freudenberger in 1970s is depersonalization. So it's when you separate yourself emotionally from your work instead of putting yourself fully into your work. So the work no longer feels meaningful and you feel detached. Uh, and then it also, he describes it as a, a decreased sense of accomplishment uh, where you just keep working harder and harder for less and less sense of what feels like you're making a difference. So every pixel you push, you get more infuriated because it doesn't feel like it's making those big strides that you want. Uh, and then he also describes uh, burnout as emotional exhaustion. So when you feel fatigued, worn out, drained uh, from all this anxiety and all this stress. So emotional uh, exhaustion uh, leads to physical exhaustion. It's that like, I can't do it anymore. I give up this like feeling of just nothing. Uh, nothing gets you excited, not even things in your personal life. Um, and in a culture like uh, what we have today in a society where work is, you know, workaholics is almost celebrated. Uh, we're seeing a lot of burnout. Uh, and Perfectionism is one of those things that leads to that, uh, especially in the creative field. Uh, we spiral and spiral because we get so latched onto those little things uh, and we wanna fix it all. Um, and you can actually get burnt out even doing work you love, even if you love designing, love painting, um, you know, love, pho love photography, um, those little things where you can't get it, can't get it just right, uh, those things can lead to burnout. Uh, and it feels like, you know, you notice a bump today uh, and that makes you notice more and more bumps uh, along the way. So it feels endless. And then this last conversation up here, uh, what's your opinion of that shade of yellow? It's horrible. Oh, I agree. So I want to focus on the shade of yellow part of this conversation. So as designers, uh, creating a color palette, I know, is no easy feat. So, you know, you can adjust the hues and saturations and lightness ever so slightly uh, and always end up with this totally different look and feel, even if there was just a couple, it was adjusted just slightly. Um, so kind of similar to pushing pixels, adjusting and constantly fine tuning that shade of yellow to just be slightly more orange or slightly more green. Uh, it can be all consuming. Uh, and this is what I call narrowing your vantage point. Uh, you can't see beyond that yellow. You know, you're adjusting that yellow, trying to sh trying to adjust that shade of yellow um, to see if you can get that exactly right yellow. But um, with that, you also um, kind of close yourself off to any other colors. Uh, what if purple was actually the right color for the job. Um, if your vantage point is so narrow, you might not be able to ever see that. Uh, and again, you get more and more frustrated because you're wondering why those other shades of yellow aren't working either. Um, so these are just some of the conversations that happen around perfectionism, some of the thoughts that we all have either internally or externally. Um, but as Voltaire says, uh, perfect is the enemy of good. Uh, bad isn't actually the enemy of good. Um, it's actually when you have your set sight on being perfect that you never even take that chance to get started or you spiral to burnout or you narrow, narrow your vantage point so small that you don't get to experience the joy and relief of just good enough, uh, good enough designing. So uh, how do we get to good enough designing? Uh, this is what I say is good enough designing is the kind that still wows your clients, wows your stakeholders, uh, but doesn't leave you drained or depleted or worn out as a human. So this is the part that I really like. You know, we talked about what perfectionism is, how it kind of affects designers. Um, but what are the things that you can do to bring in more imperfection? What are the things you can do to kind of combat uh, that burnout, that narrowing of your vantage point? How do you get started? Uh, 
So first, uh, one thing I love to tell people is let it be messy. Uh, so Marie and I were talking about how she loves to paint. That's kind of that image I get when uh, when I think of messy, like uh, paint everywhere. Uh, it's chaotic. It's kind of unhinged. It's a little bit disorganized. Uh, and I also think of uh, when we were kids. Uh, when you were a kid and you just started coloring, you know, maybe there was some yellow scribbles here, some red scribbles there, maybe some blue ones over here. Uh, and then maybe your parents got you this coloring book. Um, but, you know, you're just starting out coloring. And so you don't actually color in the lines. Uh, it's all it's all everywhere. And you go, Mom, Dad, look at this. Look how pretty this is. And of course it is. Uh, and then, you know, I, I look at this photo and I see that washable marker and I just kind of think, thank God for washable markers. Because I remember when I was a kid, I would color on the table, I'd color on the walls, you know, kind of everything was my canvas. Um, so that's kind of the level of messiness that I'm talking about. Um, when you don't get self-conscious, when you aren't bound by uh, by any of the rules or the lines of the coloring book, um, you know, you're not you're not holding yourself back. And so this is a quote that I really love. Uh, it's by uh, Aaron Copland, an American composer. He says, inspiration may be a form of super consciousness or perhaps subconsciousness. I wouldn't know, uh, but I am sure that it's the antithesis of self-consciousness. So inspiration comes from when you color outside of the line. So, um, you know, when you're self-conscious, when you want to be inside that line, that's kind of where you're narrowing your vantage point. Um, and, you know, this is all great in theory, but uh, I also want to bring it back to design. So how does it, what does this look like in theory? What is letting it be messy uh, in design and being a creative look like? Uh, so one of the things I always tell people uh, is first thing in the morning, drain your brain. Uh, and usually uh, people kind of give me this look. Um, and when I say drain your brain, um, I'm saying you wanna do this first thing in the morning uh, before you pick up your phone, before you start doom scrolling or checking your emails or texting anyone back. Um, and so what does drain your brain? Uh, draining your brain looks like this. Uh, this comes, this is an idea uh, called Morning Pages from Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way. Uh, so one of her fundamental exercises is these morning pages uh, where you, when you immediately wake up, uh, you grab a pen and paper. I did it digitally here to kind of show you what it could look like. Uh, three pages of just writing pure stream of consciousness. Uh, it's something that you're not meant to read over again. Uh, not by you, not by anyone else. Uh, it's actually not even meant to be coherent or legible. Uh, it's actually meant to be thrown out after you write it. And it's really just meant to drain your brain. Uh, so the philosophy behind morning pages is that uh, we have so much clutter in our heads uh, blocking us from being creative. Um, but if we can get that all out onto pages first thing in the morning, right when you wake up, it actually gives you space for the rest of the day to be creative, be productive be productive, be lighter, uh, and be more open to new things. So uh, things like, I need to go get my, my laundry from the dry cleaners. Uh, I need to go get more dog food. All these thoughts are things that kind of pop out throughout the day. Um, but if you can kind of put it all onto paper and kind of drain that all out early in the morning, um, you'll actually see that you get a lot more space uh, in the day to be creative. So this is uh, what my handwriting looks like normally. Uh, and this is what my handwriting looks like uh, when I do morning pages. Uh, and I know you can't read it. I can't read it. It's, I, I know I said it's meant to be thrown away. The most easy way for me to do it is to write it in a notebook that I never look back on. Um, and uh, I don't actually know what I'm saying here because, again, I can't read it. But I do remember that sometimes when I'm doing morning pages, it starts with just saying, I don't want to write this. I don't want to write this. I don't want to write this. Oh, I just heard a bus pass by. And it might seem pointless at first. Uh, and it might seem like something you don't want to do. Um, but you'll actually find out that you're a little bit less foggy in the day, um, that you might actually, even during doing your morning pages, might find some aha moments pouring out right in front of you. Um, I promise it works. OK, so brain drained. Uh, what's next? So let's bring it back to design. So in design, um, I want to talk a little bit about our childhood again. I love talking about childhood because I think that's a lot of ways uh, that we can bring in imperfection. So uh, as a kid, um, 
I remember when I would go to the park, um, my parents would, you know, bring some buckets and shovels, uh, maybe a dump truck. Uh, and I remember building these sandcastles uh, in the park. Um, you know, it's, you know, if we didn't have any, have any buckets, we would just use our hands uh, and you would make five, 10, maybe even 50 uh, sandcastles in one sitting. Uh, and you're building it with your hands or with a bucket, whatever you got. Um, and you felt like you were this master sandcastle builder. Um, so sandcastles is something I want us to think about when we're designing. Um, this is that place where you can just create and make uh, and kind of just create so many sandcastles in just one sitting. Uh, so this is where in design we say sandboxes uh, are where ideas are born. But uh, with the circle of life, you know, uh, with birth, there's also death. Uh, and I'm not actually really sure why society uh, is so afraid of death. It's to me, it's not really the opposite of death or opposite of life, uh, just as birth isn't. It's sort of part of life. And I, and I think I grew up in a culture where it was so you know celebrated as part of someone's life. Um, but kind of, I digress. Uh, and I, I want to bring this back to, you know, there's these sandboxes that we have where we're creating and making uh, and building. Um, but then there's also these places uh, um, in the creative process um, that sh that we should hold for, uh, for ideas that we want to get rid of. Um, and that's what I call these graveyards. Um, it's where we kind of say goodbye um, and, you know, go into a cemetery. It's, you know, where you say goodbye and you bury your loved ones. You know, maybe you come back and visit, definitely. Um, but you kind of lay them to rest and you kind of give them a resting ground. Uh, so this in, in design, in creative work, um, I say that this is where uh, ideas die. Um, and so having both is super important in a creative process. You know, having the space to play, uh, to be childish, to create, to build uh, your, sand, your uh, sandbox, and then also a place to let go of ideas. You know, um, not every idea is going to get the limelight. Uh, and something we say a lot at Blink is kill your darling. Uh, don't get so attached to one idea because, you know, 50 ideas might be flying by uh, in that time. So what does this actually look like for designers? Um, well, this is uh, our one of the sandboxes from our recent project. So as you can see here, uh, we were at almost 80% memory for this file. Uh, this file was one of those like laugh cry moments where you get this alert and everything starts moving really, really slow. And you're not sure if, you know, all those pixels that you pushed in the last 10 minutes actually saved. Um, but the reason why it was so big is because we were kind of going super wide with our, our designs. Um, you know, you can see a bunch of iterations that kind of all look like the same screen, but maybe something was tweaked. And then you can also see all these ideas that are totally different. Um, it was really this playground, this very childish feeling where um, you can create without feeling like you're you're beholden to any of these. Um, because just like uh, just like sandboxes, um, those sandcastles don't last forever. There's an impermanence to them. Um, they're not meant to be, you know, the final, final thing. Um, so these are those sandboxes, uh, you know, as uh, uh, when we're working with a bunch of designers, we each get a page, we each get a sandbox, uh, and we each get to, to play in them. Uh, and then because that file, you know, was getting so big, um, and there was a finite amount of memory, just like just like there's a finite amount of sand in a sandbox, uh, nothing could last forever. So um, we built these graveyards. Uh, we kind of turn that chaos into a little bit less chaos, uh, pluck out some of your favorite ideas. Uh, and then this is where I say, you let the rest of your ideas die. You kill the darlings. Uh, you know, again, not every idea was meant for the spotlight. Uh, we're not pre too precious with our, with our darlings, with our designs, um, but you gotta have both. You gotta be able to have that space to play, to create, to build, um, kind of without any restrictions. Um, and you also got to have that uh, ability to let things go. Um, so I kind of want to, after each of these sections, I like to kind of talk, um, invite people into being messy uh, in, in their, their next week. Um, so for, for this, um, what I'm saying is, you know, let it be messy. Uh, try out morning pages tomorrow. Uh, pick up a pen and paper. Uh, pick up a pen and three pieces of paper instead of your phone when you wake up. Uh, try morning pages. Try it for the next week. Uh, and see if you notice yourself being a little bit less foggy during the day. 
Uh, and then the other one I say is build a sandbox for what you're working on right now. Uh, whether you're a designer, a project manager, um, a painter, whatever it is, build a sandbox for yourself. Um, but for folks who do digital work, uh, I want to push you a little bit um, to actually use uh, markers, pens, papers, watercolors for your sandbox. Um, maybe you'll see something totally different when you're building a, uh, when you're building and doodling instead of uh, pushing pixels. All right, so we talked about letting it be messy, and now I want to talk about play and rest. Um, so this is another way uh, that you can combat perfectionism, how you can invite in more imperfection. Uh, and this one is really hard for people um, because I'm not just saying play and rest, you know, uh, outside of nine to five. I'm saying play and rest during the workday. Um, and why it's so hard, uh, because our society has normalized uh, and even encouraged praise and rewarded grind culture. So grind culture, um, Trisha Hershey, uh, the founder of Nat Ministry in her recent book, talks about grind culture uh, as grind culture has normalized pushing our bodies to the brink of destruction. We proudly proclaim showing up to work or an event despite an injury, sickness, or mental break. Uh, we are praised and rewarded for ignoring our body's need for rest, care, and repair. Um, so I will be the first to say that I've definitely gone to work sick before thinking that, you know, I have to be there. Um, and that's so normalized in our culture. Um, and, and it's been so normalized that, you know, in this cartoon, you can see this guy saying, I can't remember, do I work at home or do I live at work? Uh, and especially as we're kind of going towards this very remote, friendly uh, culture, uh, those lines become even more and more blurred. Um, it that work life that personal life it becomes so blurred that you're you maybe not even just working that nine to five maybe you're working beyond that um and in that day you're not actually taking a break for yourself you're not actually uh investing in your personal life um and what happens is we become these mindless souls uh if you guys seen the movie soul uh this is the scene where uh they're kind of in this dream world and they see these mindless wandering souls you know kind of purposeless kind of just shuffling along uh and in the real world the connection of these people here in this dream world in the real world they are the ones who are workaholics who are doom scrolling who are the folks who are just kind of these shells of themselves who don't feel like you know, who are just so, who find their meaning in their work or uh, are just so detached from their bodies. Um, but it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, and from that same movie, you see here this character Moonwing. Uh, and he says, I'm the captain of Mystics Without Borders. And he is going out to save all these mindless wandering souls. He's, um, you know, helping them get back into their body, helping them be more carefree and happy the way that he is. Um, and what he is actually doing in the real world is he is this guy. He is this guy who's this uh, sign spinner at the corner of a, a street in New York, and he's loving his life and he's living in flow. And so that connection to the dream world, this kind of very carefree character in the dream world, is this person who has brought in so much play and rest into his work uh, that he feels in his body, that he feels uh, like a human <laughs> instead of a shell of a human. So I want to talk first a little bit about play. Um, so play, uh, as Stuart Brown describes uh, in his book, Play, uh, play is an absorbing, apparently purposeless activity that provides enjoyment and suspends self-consciousness and sense of time. It's also self-motivating and makes you want to do it again. So um, not only does play relieve stress uh, and improve brain function uh, and improve your relationship with others, but it also stimulates creativity. And uh, counter to what, um, you know, corporate America might tell you, it actually increases productivity. Um, so, you know, what Stuart Brown describes as this absorbing and apparently purpose, purposeless activity is actually something that increases productivity. Um, and, is, and when society is telling me it's a waste of time, how does it something like this actually increase productivity? Well, what play actually does is it gives your brain a moment to rest. So. Think of the last time you tackled a hard problem. Maybe it was a crossword puzzle or a design problem at work 
or maybe it was even just trying to fit all your dishes into your dishwasher. Ah, I struggle with this all the time. Um, so say you're trying to jam these dishes into your dishwasher. Uh, maybe it's the end of the day, you just finished dinner, you're tired, you just want it all to be finished, and you keep trying to jam this one plate and, and you're trying to put it in a place that it just seemingly won't fit. Uh, and you get super frustrated and you kind of just like, ugh, you just give up. Um, what I call this is white knuckling. Uh, it's when you're baring your teeth, you're gripping so tightly, uh, needing to solve this problem in this very moment, uh, and you're gripping so hard that your knuckles turn white, white knuckling. Um, and it's, it's, uh, this is where play actually comes in. Um, so play is how it breaks that loop. Um, when you're white knuckling, uh, your vision narrows. Uh, you see the dishwasher in just one way, the exact layout that it's currently at, and this dish just won't fit. Um, and you can't really envision it any other way. Um, but if you bring in play, even for just 10 to 20 minutes, uh, even if it's something as simple as tossing a Nerf ball back and forth between uh, you and another person, uh, your brain actually gets a break. Um, you kind of get out of that thought loop of like, this dish needs to go here and it won't fit. Um, and you actually might return later and realize that there was a spot in the back all along. Um, you might see something that your foggy white knuckle brain couldn't see before. So what I say is to get out and get inspired. Um, for me, that looks like eating at hole in the wall restaurants. It uh, looks like biking out to catch a sunset. Uh, it also looks like dressing up and working on my Halloween costume. Uh, this was probably my most proud uh, Halloween costume ever. This is Joe Butapaki from Everything Everywhere All at Once. If you haven't seen it, just know that Everything Bagels literally have everything, including your hopes and dreams. And it looks like blindfolded baking with my friends. It's blindfolding someone uh, and having them bake something while I'm giving them instructions and I can't touch any of the ingredients. Uh, it also, for me, looks like snowboarding. Uh, and here I push myself a little bit too much. Uh, and But despite, you know, getting injured, it, these are all things that were pure fun, absorbing and apparently purposeless. Um, but play also doesn't have to be hours and hours and hours. You know, some of these things, you know, um, going snowboarding might be a whole day experience, but, you know, working on your Halloween costume, it could be 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Um, you know, play again, it can be simple as just 10 minutes of laying out and looking at the clouds, you know, between meetings, finding time for yourself, uh, just to go outside, maybe sit on your deck, sit on the lawn, sit on the field. Um, and you never actually know how an elephant in the cloud could inspire your next design. Uh, because whoever created this CAPTCHA definitely was inspired by seeing horses in the clouds. Uh, and I don't know if you guys have seen this, but there's been a lot of them coming out of, uh, Click on the horse made of clouds. All right, so I talked about play, um, but I wanna talk about rest as well. So um, this is where I say, close your eyes to close the loop. Uh, this is me and my dog sleeping. Uh, and when I told my parents, when I told them about this slide, I told them about this deck, they kind of laughed at me um, because we kind of have this running joke in our family uh, because all of us kind of slightly sleep with our eyes open. Uh, we actually don't really know why, uh, and it just, all of us do it for some reason. It's a little bit creepy, but we also made it into a running joke where we kind of take pictures of each other when it happens, uh, and we actually made a mug for, of it with, for my dad last year. Um, but anyways, besides the point, uh, close your eyes to close the loop. Um, so why do we need rest? Uh, so with with our current culture, with our, our grind culture, with, um, you know, you know, having to push yourself and push yourself, uh, it's become like deadlines are life or death. It feels like, you know, this all consuming crushing thing if we don't get to it. Um, if we miss a deadline, something really, really bad is gonna happen. Um, so then as a society, we have actually villainized procrastination. So when I say the word procrastination, I'm pretty sure most people associate it with something negative, maybe laziness, maybe someone who's not hardworking. You know, if you're a hiring manager, you know, if someone says, what's your superpower procrastination? Uh, you know, you might not want to hire them. You know, there's this negative connotation with that word. Um, our society demonizes, you know, naps, 
resting, uh, going for a run even. Um, but if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we as a society need to rest. Um, so if you look closer at this cartoon, you know, uh, you can see that this woman's working really hard. You can see how tired she is and she feels like she has to keep on grinding, has to keep on going. Um, and this procrastination muse says, you look tired. Why don't you take a nap? Or you'll think so much more clearer after you after a run. These are all things that we should be doing. We should be taking care of ourselves. Um, the, but we right now associate them with procrastination, uh, with things um, that keep us from our work, uh, from being that perfect employee, being that um, that you know that perfect working bee. Um, but it's actually not bad things. Um, there was a study that NASA done that found that organizations with employees who took a nap for at least 30 minutes every day were up to 35% more productive than their competitors. 35% more productive when they took a nap. Um, and that's that's because just like play, uh, rest actually gives your brain a rest. It gives it time to recover, reboot, uh, because we're not robots. Uh, we're not meant to run on no rest, uh, just like we can't run on no food or no water. So rest is just as important. Um, and rest can look different for different people. Um, you know, people kind of think of rest as taking a nap, uh, but it can also just look like sitting on your couch daydreaming, uh, zoning out. It can look like watching the clouds or going for a walk. It could be stretching or, or reading or cooking or meditating. Um, and so it can look different for everyone, um, but there is this general consensus that rest all feels the same. Um, there's a general consensus when you feel like you are resting, you feel relaxed. You don't feel worried. You don't feel tensed. Um, and there's a consensus that it's both your mind and your body that are resting. Um, that's when you actually feel rest is when both your mind and your body can do it together. Um, so it's really not anything revolutionary that rest is important. I don't think I'm, you know, making this big claim, uh, big new claim, um, because we've been told our whole lives, you know, eight hours of sleep. Uh, but what I'm advocating for here is to rest during the workday. Uh, and in William Duggan's book, uh, Strategic in Intuition, The Creative Spark in Human Achievement, he asserts that when you completely let go, uh, even of trying to solve a problem at hand, when you walk away from this problem that you are trying to white knuckle your way through, uh, your brain actually gets to have space and time to let information in your head move around. And so what he means is that when you take a break, it's actually, you're able to actually take all the apparently unrelated information swirling around in your head, you're able to recategorize them, resort them, uh, and it actually turns into innovative solutions. So um, he's saying that we have all this information in our head. Um, it just wasn't organized to form insights because our brain was so cluttered. Our vantage point was so narrow in trying to solve this one problem. Um, and we didn't give ourselves a break to break for our head to kind of resort itself out. So I like to kind of think of this Rubik's cube. Uh, all the colors and all the pieces are there. All your thoughts, all your information is there. Um, you kind of just have to resort and reorganize them. And this is where rest comes in. Rest gives you that space um, to be able to reorganize yourself. Um, and so when you take that rest, uh, this is where um, why shower aha moments are, are such a big thing. Have you ever had like some of your best thoughts in your shower? You know, that's why aqua notes are things that were created um, because, you know, and you're in the shower um, and you're like, oh, I have this great idea for this design I want to do or for this painting I want to make. Um, and so the reason why is because when you're showering, you're often relaxed. You're almost meditative. It's this activity that you do day over day. Um, you're, you're resting. Uh, and when you're resting, both your mind and your body, um, you get to be into this relaxed state. Uh, you kind of get into this good mood. Uh, and there are studies that have shown uh, that you're able to develop innovative and creative thoughts when you are relaxed uh, and in a good mood. So this is why shower ideas are are. Um, so apparent for most people. So what does play and rest look like in action? Well, I would encourage you to get as silly and playful and restful as possible. So, you know, make up a country song in the shower about what you want your day to look like. You know, give it the most country song title you can think of and sing the chorus at the top of your lungs. Um, or, you know, if you don't want to do that, go lie out in a field this week, uh, watch the clouds roll by, create as many characters and scenes as possible, you know, bring a buddy and see if they see the same things. 
uh, or take out six ingredients from your fridge or pantry, you know, number each of the items, roll a dice three times and make a meal with the three items that, uh, that you selected. Or simply take a nap. Uh, extra points if you drool on the pillow. Um, but do these during the work day, you know. Um, make sure you find some time during your work day. Um, again, we know that rest is important, um, but what I'm saying here is find time for rest, find time for play during your work day. Okay, so we have let it be messy, we have play and rest. Uh, the last one I want to talk about that I love to tell people about is be wrong. Um, so, you know, people thought playing rest was hard during the workday. Uh, being wrong is super hard for people. Um, so I kind of want to pause here and I, I want to ask you, uh, what does being wrong feel like? I would love for you guys to put in the chat what that feels like for you. Um, so if you guys have a second, write in the chat, what does uh, being wrong feel like? I'll give you guys a second. Defeating. Not working nonstop during the workday is an example. Vulnerable, embarrassing, shame, guilt, fail, guilty. Cool. These are all these are all great answers. So defeating, embarrassing, shame. So I want to say, you know, all of you guys are describing um not actually what it feels like to be wrong. Um, what I think you guys are actually describing is what happens when you realize you're wrong. Um, so when you realize you're wrong, that's when you start to feel all those things, right? You start to feel embarrassed. You start to feel shame. Um, you start to feel defeated. Uh, but um, right now, before you've actually even get, gotten to that point, before you've actually realized you're wrong, it actually feels like you're being right. You think that you're right uh, up until the moment that you realize you're wrong. Um, and so actually being wrong feels like being right. Um, and it's only when you realize you're wrong that you start to feel defeated, embarrassed, shame, guilty, feeling like a failure. Um, all those things that you guys have said here in the chat. Um, so a great visual I like to think about is uh, Wile E. Coyote from Looney Tunes. Um, so Wile E. Coyote, he's always chasing the roadrunner. Um, and it's that moment where he's running off the cliff while he's chasing the roadrunner. Uh, and as you can see here, he's already off the cliff, uh, but he's still running super confidently. Um, and it isn't usually until he realizes that he's off the cliff that he actually starts to fall. Um, and of course, you know, physics doesn't actually make sense. Uh, you know, you actually, as soon as you run off a cliff, you would fall. But I think this is a great way to think about what it feels like to be wrong. So you're running, you're running, you're running. Even though you're wrong, you still think you're right. And it isn't until that moment when you realize it that we start to feel uh, defeated, feel shame, feel guilty, feel that, feel like we're a failure. Um, and that feeling, this fall right here, that feeling of being defeated, guilty, uh, a failure, it's such a painful experience for some people that they never want to be wrong. They never want to admit they're wrong. Uh, and people never want to admit their mistakes. They never want to apologize. Um, so why is that? Um, I think it's because that perfectionist in us, in us wants to be perfect uh, and being wrong isn't perfect. Uh, we as a society don't make room for being wrong. We cancel people. Uh, you know, top stories on the news are usually things about people messing up or bad things that are happening. Um, you know, scandals sell. Uh, our egos, our perfectionism, it keeps us from allowing us to be wrong uh, individually, but then as a society, we don't allow ourselves to be wrong. Um, but I want to change that. Um, so what is it like to embrace being wrong? Um, so before I jump into that, uh, I want to talk about this black line. So this is uh, from the book 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, uh, which I super highly recommend for everyone. I do a book club with, club with my friends every year on this. Um, the authors here uh, start by drawing this big black line across the page. Um, and they say, this is the most important model we know for being a conscious leader. Um, and this model is either binary, uh, is, is binary, either or. Um, at any point, a leader is either above the line or below the line. Um, if you're above the line, you're leading consciously. If you're below it, you are not. 
So what does it mean to be above the line or below the line? So uh, being above the line is being open, being curious, being committed to learning. When you're below the line, uh, you're closed, you're defensive, you're committed to being right. Uh, so even good leaders go below the line. Um, you know, uh, at any point, you know, throughout the day, you can shift from going above and below the line. Um, but conscious leaders at any moment are going to check in with themselves and realize that they're below the line and they'll make that shift to moving above the line. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about being committed to learning and committed to being right, because uh, that is what this section's about. Um, so what does uh, being committed to learning look like? So uh, Commitment two of 15 uh, is learning through curiosity. So I'm going to bring back that black line again um, here. Uh, being being above the line is committed to growing in self-awareness, committed to regarding every interaction as an opportunity to learn and committed to curiosity as a path to rapid learning. Uh, when you're below the line, you commit to being right. You commit to seeing the situation as something that's happening to you. You commit to being defensive uh, and you commit to being certain that you are absolutely right. Um, so what does committed to learning look like? Uh, it starts with saying, I don't know, uh, especially for me in the work, uh, at an agency, it's sometimes really, really, really hard to say, you know, clients hire us for our expertise. Uh, so it can be scary to say, I don't know. Um, but I can assure you that, uh, that it's actually so much worse to be trying to make something up on the spot when a client asks you a question, uh, you know, a client can tell, uh, your stakeholders can tell, people can tell when you're kind of just making things up on the spot. So saying I don't know actually helps you build trust and rapport. Um, because sometimes when you're making things up on the spot, it feels disingenuous. Um, so I like to say your I don't knows make me trust your trust your I do knows. Uh, and there's also something super empowering about saying I don't know. Um, it embraces that super that very human side of ourselves that we're not all knowing uh it also encourages and makes space for others to feel comfortable doing the same uh and so in general it creates this more genuine and, and honest environment uh and then there's the and then they're saying uh that's interesting tell me more so instead of getting defensive uh when there's sort of this dissenting opinion uh you give your chance to so chance Give yourself a chance to cool off um, when you ask your someone to tell you more. Um, and you might actually never know. You know, you might have misinterpreted what they originally said. And, and saying, tell me more, gives you more of that chance to, to hear about it. And then lastly, uh, this is the part that I find um, that I, I try to bring in a lot is, is wonder. So lastly, saying I wonder. Um, so wonder is something that's open ended. It's it's not meant to be figuring something out, but rather stepping into that unknown. Uh, it's exploring openly and curiously. Uh, and it opens us up to getting more comfortable with not knowing. Uh, we get comfortable being uncomfortable in the unknown. Uh, we actually get comfortable with imperfection. We don't uh, need to close the loop. We don't need to put everything in neat little boxes. Um, and what that's actually doing when you're wondering is letting go of control. Uh, and that's a trait that our perfectionist tells us that we cannot live without. Um, we need to be in control. We need to know how this is all going to end. Um, but wonder, it actually opens you up to that. You know, I wonder how the ancient empires built their roads. I wonder what it must have felt like to be the inventor of the dishwasher. Uh, I wonder if the words I'm saying right now are making a difference. So wonder, being committed to learning, um, that's one way you can uh, move, uh, embrace being wrong. But, you know, there's also when you're committed to learning, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you've let go of being committed to being right. Uh, so another one of the commitments is explore the opposite. So uh, it it looks like um, this line again, uh, where when you're above the line, uh, you're you're committed to seeing the opposite of your story as true or truer than your original story. You recognize that you interpret the world around you and give meaning to that story. Uh, whereas when you're below the line, you commit to believing your stories and the meaning you give them as the truth. You commit that everything that you're thinking is the truth, is right. Um, and so a great exercise for this, uh, it's, it's something that's really hard for folks to do in the moment when they have a very strong opinion. When you're a designer and you're showing your client some work, you're like, this is the way to do it. Um, but maybe there's an opposite. Um, so the four questions comes from Byron Katie's uh, meditative method called the work. So when you're feeling super attached to an idea, uh, stop to ask yourself these four questions. 
Is it true? Can you absolutely know it's true? How do you feel when you believe that thought? And who would you be without that thought? So I'm going to walk through an example really quick from actual client work. So this was towards the end of a project that we did. Uh, this was this healthcare project. We were kind of just buttoning things up and we were showing them this design. And they said, hey, we want that top navigation bar to be blue. I don't really like the white. Like, let's make it dark blue. Um, and I remember me and the designer looking at each other and being like, oh, no, like that would be super ugly. Um, we, you know, the global navigation has to be white. You know, this is a very light, light colored design. It has to be white. Anything else would be ugly. So when you go through the, the Byron Kitty's four questions, it starts with, is it true? Well, yeah, it's true. Like a light colored website has to has to have a light colored navigation. Uh, it's just best practice. Uh, so then you ask yourself, can you actually know it's true? Well, you know, is it best practice? Is it what everyone else does? Um, so you start to question yourself. You start to think, is this true? And then this is where it starts to get a little bit more vulnerable. How do you feel when you believe this thought? So I ask myself, how do I feel when I believe the thought that the global navigation has to be white? Well, I feel frustrated. I feel annoyed. I feel righteous. I feel challenged by my client. You know, how dare they say that? You know, I, I'm, I'm the designer. They hired me for this. Um, but then I realized what I was feeling was not this absolute love for this navigation like a child or anything. It wasn't this hill that I really wanted to die on. Why I was feeling frustrated and annoyed was because I wanted to be right. I wanted to be the expert. I wanted my clients to see me as the expert. Uh, and their, challenge, their, their ask actually felt like a challenge to my expertise. Um, but it wasn't. It was simply just a different opinion. Uh, but in that moment, I couldn't really see it. So then there's that fourth question, who would you be without that thought? Who would I be if the global navigation was blue instead of white? Well, it's one component of thousands of components in the library we created for them. Uh, it is uh, one project in the many products I'm going to be doing. Um, so at the end of the day, I'd still be me. I'd still be Elodie. Uh, and so this is the global navigation that we ended up with. Uh, spoiler, I am still a designer. I'm still me. It's not all consuming. Uh, and so embracing being wrong, inviting in the opposite, uh, learning through curiosity, um, this allows us to humanize each other. This allows us to embrace the very real fact that we're imperfect uh, and that it's part of that human experience. So instead of needing to spin things or always be the expert, we say, I don't know. Uh, we explore the opposite. Um, and so in action, you know, tomorrow morning, uh, make a list of 10 things you wonder about. Uh, it could be about anything or everything. Or think back to a time last week you fought with someone to be right. Reach out to them. Apologize. Ask them, them for their viewpoint. Uh, or today, when you notice having a strong opinion about something, stop and ask yourself, is it true? Is it absolutely true? Uh, and I'll leave you with this very last thought, as well as all these photos from my life. Uh, we are humans first and designers second. Uh, so just like that global navigation didn't define me, uh, nor do our job titles. Um, we are humans first. We want to embrace being human. And being human means being imperfect. Uh, it means, um, you know, getting things wrong. It means being messy and it means playing and resting. Uh, and you might just find that you are actually creating and building and designing a lot more than before when you start to embrace these parts of yourself. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Elodie. That was great. Um, definitely resonated. I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way. Yeah. Um, All righty, we're at time, so we'll wrap up, and the session is now concluded. Thank you.